So uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first of our concurrent sessions uh, today. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us uh, Walter Burns, who is a teacher and a materials uh, writer from Connecticut. Uh, he has taught um, in Pakistan and the South Pacific, as well as in the United States. Currently, he writes ESL materials, including textbooks and assessment materials, and also blogs. Uh, you can find all this information in the uh, little text box uh, in the lower right-hand corner if you want to go to his blog at EnglishAdvantage.info. So uh, without uh, further ado, I turn it over to uh, Walton. Thank you for being here today, Walton. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, and um, actually, I'm uh, very excited to be um, part of a Belgian um, event um, because my parents um, are American, but they lived um, in Belgium, in Brussels, and actually met there and were married there. Um, so I have a sort of soft spot for Belgium um, and Belgian chocolates uh, in my heart. Um, and it's, uh, Brussels is a lovely city to visit. I highly recommend it. Um, I have nothing to say about Toronto. I've never been there. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the genre approach uh, to writing. Um, and it's a very exciting time um, because it's a fairly new method. It's 25 or 30 years old, um, which um, is enough that there's, there's materials out there. There's a lot of theoretical materials. There's some teacher guides. There's some student written material. Um, material for students, some articles on implementation, um, but I don't think it hasn't penetrated enough. It's it's still new enough that there's room for a lot more. There's a lot a need for a lot more materials to use in the classroom um, for teachers, um, experiments on implementation, effectiveness. Um, so I'm sort of coming to you in the spirit of this is a really cool thing uh, that I've discovered that I. I'm excited about, um, and I hope that you will uh, also think it's cool and uh, use it and do amazing things um, with. Um, and I do have a handout um, that I'm just putting together now, um, but you can email me, um, and I'll happily send that to you um, with lots of the stuff that I'm talking about today. Um, so when I originally, um, what I really want to do is spend most of my time on um, the last point, um, how do you teach the genre approach? Because um, I think that's um, what's interesting. What does it look like in the classroom? What kinds of activities um, are, uh, are involved? What can we do with the students? Um, in order to do that, I think we also have to look a little bit at um, what the genre approach is, because um, it's new for a lot of people. Um, I think. And um, at one point, I had wanted to talk about sort of why do we need it? Why are we moving past the five paragraph essay? Um, which is a way of talking about, you know, um, what's so great about the genre approach. Um, but I think that I would rather, um, in the interest of time, get to the sort of more interactive um, classroomy stuff. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, sort of skip that bit. Um, but hopefully, we'll come out why we need a new approach, I think, writing. Um, so what is the genre approach? Um, the genre approach um, really takes as its starting point um, the idea that writers write for a purpose, um, and a specific purpose. Um, we don't just write to compare and contrast uh, two things, um, as we might tell our students. Um, we write to compare and contrast two things in order to tell you which one is better, or in order to point out that one of those things is actually very bad and should not be used. Um, or we persuade, we write persuasive essays, but we persuade someone to do something very specific. We write a letter to the editor to persuade someone to vote a certain way, or not vote a certain way, or write a letter to their um, representative. Um, so we write for a purpose and a very specific purpose. Um, writers also write from a particular author role, which is to say, um, I wrote this presentation as a teacher um, and as a, um, you might say, as an expert. Not that I consider myself an expert, but I wrote it from the role of an expert, someone who knows something. Um, 
if I were to write a presentation as um, a father or uh, write a letter as a disgruntled consumer, it would be a very different um, piece of writing. And finally, um, we also, of course, write to a particular audience. Um, we know something about the people we're writing to, or at least the people that we, we want to write to. Um, if I write a, a memo to uh, my fellow teachers working at my school, um, I know their concerns, I know um, their interests, I know something about them. Um, if you write an advertisement, you might be targeting a very specific demographic. Um, our students writing essays, academic essays, uh, will be writing to experts or um, fellow students or um, the teacher, and they, you sort of you um, you have some idea of your audience. And I don't think any of this is new or controversial. Um, that you know we write for a purpose, we write from an author stance, um, and we write to an audience. But the genre approach really puts that centrally, um, and the fact that that changes how we write um, content tone, register, um, the language we use, grammatical features. Um, and then the genre approach goes further to say that in order to write successfully, to achieve our purpose, um, we use these socially determined forms of writing um, called genres. Um, and I just put in a little footnote, all of what I'm saying does apply to speaking, um, but uh, obviously we're talking about writing. Um, but just to sort of throw that throw that out there at you. Um, so um, we have these conventional forms that we use um, when we want to write to achieve a certain purpose. Um, a cover letter is a kind of writing that's written by job applicants to a potential employer for the purpose of saying that you are the best person for this job. Um, and that's something that's conventionally determined, culturally determined, um, what a cover letter is and how they're written. Um, and then um, we can take it further and we can say that these genres, in this sense, these forms of documents or writing, they have particular linguistic features, patterns of organization, um, their structures, um, grammatical forms that they use, um, lexical sets, um, content, obviously different contents, um, that, that, that shape them and that make them what they are. Um, and we can teach students these features so that their writing can be more effective. Because um, I think when we teach, um, we often think about you know, good and bad. We tell students, this is not a good essay. You need to work on this. Um, but what we really mean, I think, is that they're not effective. They're not achieving their purpose. Um, their essay is not persuasive because they have failed to give enough examples. Or their comparison and contrast has not successfully shown which one is better because the structure is not um, in the correct order. Um, so I hope, I hope this is kind of somewhat clear. Um, but I think that the best way to make it clear is sort of to look at um, examples. Now, the question of what is a genre is um, something that's debatable. Um, and um, if you want to get into it, the John Swales book, which again, I have, I have the reference on my handout, um, but uh, he gets very much into the, how a genre is defined in different fields. I've sort of gone with the most teacher-friendly um, and sort of real-world friendly um, examples. Um, and a definition. Um, so to me, a genre is a document that, again, has sort of, um, we can all agree on the, the linguistic features. It has a particular order of organization and language. Um, and it's generally written by a certain author or set of authors for a certain purpose um, to a certain audience. Um, so for example, in academic English, our students might be writing um, we might be writing, uh, reflection papers. And a reflection paper, um, I think we all kind of know what that is, more or less. Um, it has a certain structure. Um, it has a certain, it uses academic language, but not necessarily, um, but a personal language is also allowed in a reflection paper. So it has a unique um, register. Um, and it's generally written by students in classes. Um, in order to organize their thoughts, in order to um, 
maybe prove that they've done the reading, uh, depending on the teacher. And um, it's written for professors or maybe fellow students. Um, other genres um, in academic English that you might be, your students might be um, having to write a feasibility study if they're an engineering student or a business student. Um, lab reports, a critique like a book review a summary, to paraphrase. Um, right, business English. Um, there's a number of genres, types of writing we teach our students. Um, and it's just, just to kind of trick out the difference here, I have included, I think an informational work memo is very different from a chiding work memo. Um, while they both share a lot in common, um, the purpose is different. And that really um, changes the language use. Um, there are certain set for a chiding memo um, is often because it's giving bad news um, and it's coming from a position of authority. Um, the author will generally try to put himself above and distance himself from the reader and use more formal uh, language. Um, and will often try to write justify um, and make it look like it's not personal, it's, um, it's coming from some objective source. So um, attached, please find the bylaws of the company that explain why this behavior is unacceptable. Um, and that's really what the genre approach looks at, is these nuances, um, how the purpose changes how we write, um, even in the very language, um, and how the audience, small changes in the audience or the author can actually change, have large changes in the um, language. Um, and that's something that our students may or may not be um, attuned to and aware of, um, particularly if they are coming from a foreign country into um, a different country, into the US or the UK, um, to study, or in Australia or any other country, because um, these things are very often socially, culturally determined. Um, so I hope that, that makes it a bit clear. Um, and also then in general English, um, in real life, we write in genres. Um, this is not something limited to um, professions or academics, right? A letter to a friend is a genre that has a particular language set um, and structure. An instructional note, like a note to the babysitter, um, is also sort of a genre, right? It has a purpose. It has a certain features that we look at it and we know what it is. And we know it's not a letter to a friend or a PhD dissertation. Um, so, in some ways, it's a very different way of looking at writing than the five paragraph essay um, because, um, just very briefly, I will say that it deals with sort of authentic texts um, and it allows, uh, the genre approach allows students to look and to create a diverse range of texts. Whereas I think the way that the five paragraph essay is taught and the way, um, you know, you're all obviously wonderful teachers and you're doing all sorts of wonderful things in your classroom you wouldn't be at this conference if you didn't want to um, to, um, to service your students, to give your students, um, to, to teach your students effectively and how to be wonderful writers. Um, but the way that the, the, the traditional ELT method, um, e, e, um, ESL method of the five paragraph essay, is a one size fits all um, form that I don't think does justice to the diverse needs of our students. Um, so, how do you teach um, the uh, genre approach? What does a lesson or a series of lessons look like? Um, well, first of all, this is one way to do it. And again, it's a new field, so I hope that you guys will implement it and hybrid, you know, create hybrid methods and um, maybe work with create. You could do it with creative writing um, and the genre method. Um, it's not, it's, it, it doesn't just have to be for these very serious nonfiction methods. Um, so, um, the first step um, in one way to do it, the way it's generally agreed upon, um, and I like, I've used um, in my classroom, introducing the genre so that students understand especially the social context around the genre. What's the purpose? What's the author? What's the audience? Where do you find them? And then, um, very important, deconstructing model texts, giving them examples, letting them look at it and finding those key features that we talked about. How is it organized? What kind of language or grammar does it use? What kind of vocabulary does it use? Um, and how do we reproduce that in our own writing? Um, and then a third step um, that sometimes is missed in the traditional uh, classroom um, is the uh, collaborative writing um, stage, um, where students are encouraged to um, write in groups, 
uh, to practice these skills in groups, maybe as a class, maybe with the teacher, and um, scaffold the experience a little bit. I'm sorry, my, my throat is extremely dry. Um, probably, I don't know why. Um, and then finally, um, uh, not finally, I would say finally, the independent writing stage where the students then produce the piece of writing that they're supposed to be producing. Um, and then a, a nice step to add on that we again don't always do in our classrooms or it's not, it's not um, put forward as something we should be doing, whether we do it or not, um, is linking it to related texts and genres, is explaining, showing them how other forms of texts, other genres are related um, to what we've done, um, to what they've just written. Um, so um, I'd like to um, share some, for each stage, I'd like to share some activities. Um, and I see, I think just looked over this. Some of you are very familiar with the genre approach. Um, that's awesome. And um, you can also maybe share some activities and things that you do in the classroom um, during, before, after the session. Um, and, oh, and my spiral. This is, uh, this is my favorite special effect, just to show that um, the genre approach, um, it sounds very advanced, and I think a lot of times in the US especially, it's been applied to graduate students' dissertations, um, to very advanced writing. But a beginning level student can write a cover letter, just a very simple one. My name is Ali, I work in a bank, I like math, please hire me, I do not lie, I am hard worker, my telephone is. They can write a cover letter. They can write in that genre. It's just going to be a very simple one. So um, the genre approach can be used at different um, levels, um, uh, depending on the level of your students and their familiarity. Um, so I guess some of you are familiar with the genre approach, which is awesome. Um, so the first stage is um, introducing the genre and who wrote it and why. Um, and this is something that I would do with my more advanced students. Um, so I'm going to ask you, um, I'm going to stop talking because I'm tired of my voice. And um, this is our model text. Um, it's a brief report. I thought it was a nice semi, you know, it's academic, but it's also non-academic. It's not very long. Um, so I'm going to tell you that it is a summary of um, research, of new research. Um, but I want you to take a couple minutes to look at this text and um, tell me who wrote this text? Who's the author? Right, Sarah Bosley. Um, and who is Sarah Bosley? Do we know anything about her? I know I'm scaffolding, but what do we know? What, 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 what do we do? We know anything about Sarah? Who is she? What, what her author role is? She's a health correspondent. She's a journalist, right? Um, and she's a journalist specializing in the area of health. And she works for the Guardian, um, which um, your students may know or may not know is a very is a um, you know, it's a traditional newspaper. Um, it's equivalent to maybe the New York Times. Um, I don't know the political bent of it, um, but it's a fairly traditional newspaper. Um, so, oh, and I, well, I've blown my second question, which is then, where would you find, well, I guess um, Frances is, um, is, is, is an advanced student. She's gone ahead. Where would you find a text like this? What's the context where you would see this text? I don't think I gave it away. This is, you know, a newspaper. Um, so, um, and then you might, you know, how do you know that? What was the headline? What was the name? Um, who do you think would, um, read a text like this? What's the audience? And that was, a, that was an open question. General Palmer, truck drivers and things. That's interesting. Anyone? Yeah. 
but I realize it's, it's hard to, to scan it and then and then answer this question. Um, but we can think about there: you know, who reads newspapers, um, the general public, um, not scientists, though, right? A, would a scientist read this article? Um, probably not. Um, yeah, people who drive, um, who are involved in dealing with risky drivers, um, whether they be mothers or police. Um, um, yeah, because the headline might catch their eye. Um, this research might be interesting to them. Um, right, and we can, and I can go on, you know, with my students, um, you know, quizzing them on what they think the context and the social um, aspects of this are. We can ask, what would they, what, what might you do with this text? Um, what times? Um, I do want to make sure to leave time for questions. Um, afterwards. Um, but so I might go on and ask, you know, what would you do with this text? Or um, have you ever seen anything like this in another um, context? Um, so that's one way to really introduce the genre, is, you, is I call it, um, what is this thing? Um, where you ask these students these guided questions. Um, you can also ask students, I'm sort of going backwards by my slide. Um, you can also just ask students, what do you think this genre looks like? What does a book review look like? What does a brief report look like? What does a PhD dissertation look like? And really draw on their experience um, and their knowledge um, so that you're not just saying, in America or in English, we write like this. And please forget everything you've learned before now. You know, students know things about genres, although they may be slightly different depending on their culture and their situation. Um, and another approach um, to introducing this context is a, to give them a case study or a role play, putting them in the um, situation of the author or possibly the audience, and letting them sort of figure out what kind of genre they might use um, to, to achieve their purpose. Um, you are a medical student. You have just um, discovered an amazing fact with your research that you want the world to be aware of. What would you do? Well, I would call Sarah Bosley, who's the health correspondent center of press release. <coughs> um, and then another thing um, to do um, to be more explicit, these are all sort of implicit ways of student guided ways, um, and other, a more explicit way to do it um, is that there are these little dossiers, as I call them, on genres, um, sort of that explain what is a brief report, who are the author, who is the author, who are the audience, what is the purpose. Um, and you can sort of Google them and find them, or you can make them yourself. Um, and that's obviously a very teacher-centered, explicit way to do it. Um, but then from there, what I would do, I would give this to my students um, before I gave them the model text. And then I would have them look at the model text and say, do you agree? Do you disagree? And what, what clues are there in the text that tell you that, um, that this dossier is, in fact, correct? Um, so now that students have an idea of the genre, um, it's a really important step is to give them the model text, um, and actually model texts, as I'll get to in a minute. Um, and make them aware of those key language features that we were talking about that um, they are going to need to reproduce in their own writing. Um, so again, since you're a very advanced class um, with excellent reading skills and English skills, um, I'm going to um, ask you to take another minute or two to look at this model text and just kind of what do you notice about the language, the organization, uh, the grammar, the what do you think are the key features um, of this text? And it could be just anything. Now the tone is factual. <laughs> you might hear my, my two-year-old going to the snap that. Factual tone, um, yeah, it's very factual. Um, Lots of students got statistics, exact statistics. Um, 
Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's written a lot in the past tense. Um, it has yet yeah, authoritative. It gives authority. Um, yes, it uses a lot of passive tense, which is something we tell our students not to do, right? Passive voice. Um, it's something we tell our students not to do, but actually about 50% of the verbs are in the passive tense. Um, so uh, it's one of the reasons the genre approach, the stage is so important to have them actually look at an actual text and see what the actual features are. And it, yeah, it uses a lot of noun clauses. Um, and then in content, yeah, it mentions a journal, so it, it, it describes the study in great detail. These are all wonderful, um, great things to do. Um, these are all great observations. I mean, you're a wonderful class. Um, and then, um, you know, and then I might also, another way to sort of bring these things out rather than leaving it so open is obviously guided questions. Um, so I could ask you, um, how many sentences are there in each paragraph? Look at the first four paragraphs. How many sentences are there? One. Again, something we tell our students is not allowed. So that's sort of interesting. That these are a lot of one-sentence paragraphs. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll tell you that the, um, the fifth paragraph is two sentences. Um, and I think the, there's another two-sentence paragraph. Um, so. Um, so that's interesting. Um, and um, another guided question. Well, if I was in the classroom here, um, are the sentences long or short? Uh, long. Right, because um, you're obviously you're an advanced class. Um, I might have students count the number of words in a number of sentences and see what they think about that. Um, so you guys are awesome. Um, I think you've hit everything that I was looking at. Um, if I was going to analyze this text, um, we said a lot of this. Um, notice there's a headline and a byline because it's a newspaper article. Um, so that's something we want to teach our students how to do. Um, one sentence paragraphs. Someone mentioned it uses noun clauses a lot. Um, it's very information dense, um, which is a feature of formal academic writing. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is these noun phrases, um, like, um, you can't see my finger on the screen here. Sleep deprived drivers is, a, is more condensed than drivers who are deprived of sleep, um, or even drivers who are sleep deprived. <clears throat> um, so these long sentences, lots of clauses, also add to the information density. Because when you're analyzing the model texts, you want to make sure students are, are seeing what the key features are but that they are also um, seeing why, what the effect of these things is, what the effect of these key features are, um, because authors write for a purpose. Um, and lots of passive verbs, we already said. Um, so that's a pretty good range of things that we could um, have our students practice. Um, and the content, I think a lot, some of you mentioned the content, um, which is important. It's about research. It includes statistics. Um, exact statistics. Um, so uh, where is it? so um, ways to make students aware of these um, key features, open questions, just giving it to them and telling them to take a look at it, guided questions, um, having them label sections, you give them the text, um, you give the names and purposes of different parts of the text and let them match them up. Uh, jigsaw readings where you actually cut the text into parts and then each group has a part that they can analyze. Um, or relay reading, which is kind of the same thing, but you put the parts on the wall. Um, you find the part that has a summary run. Um, reverse outlining. Um, writing frames can be a great way to draw attention to sort of the language um, by leaving blanks, and then they have to copy from the text key words or key grammatical structures. Um, incomplete texts, um, which is sort of much the same thing. Um, and then vocabulary or grammar analysis, having them um, count the number of passive verbs, um, circle the number of words that are synonyms for tiredness um, in order to draw attention to, um, to certain grammatical structures or vocabulary. 
Um, and then overall, someone actually mentioned um, comparing similar or dissimilar genres. That can be a great way um, to, uh, to bring out genre features. So this is a brief report. This is an abstract for a peer-reviewed journal. Um, both of them are about research. Both of them are summaries. But what are the differences? What are the similarities? Um, and again, a dossier. Um, you can go again, go online, Google search genre plus name of genre, and you will find these um, documents that tell students very explicitly uh, what the structure is and what the grammatical features are. Um, and you can also make them yourself. Um, so this is an example of a labeling exercise um, where I have the sample text again, and then I have the different parts with a sort of description, and students can make the match. Find the part of the text that summarizes the key results of the research in one or two sentences. Find the byline, find the headline. Um, and I just want to point out before I move on, I think it's very important that students see multiple model texts. Because um, you don't want them just copying your model. Um, and you don't want them thinking that genres are not written in stone. They're not um, boilerplate templates. They're not writing frames where you just fill in key language. There's creativity involved, right? Um, not every cover letters are different, um, although, even though they share a number of features. So you want to make sure that they um, are looking at different uh, texts and comparing them and looking at um, this text has a picture. This text has a table. Um, this text has a subheadline. This one doesn't. Um, this one, um, um, and why? Again, always bringing it back to why, not just you need to do this because you need to copy um, the model, but what's the effect? Why doesn't this one have? Why does this one have a table? Well, because it has very complicated statistical information. Why does this one have a picture? Because it's on the front page and you want to draw attention to it. Um, so, um, so there's that. So then the next step, um, as I said, um, is very often collaborative construction, having students um, work in groups, work as a class, work with teachers to practice um, all of these skills that, that um, implementing these key features, um, writing, in this case, writing long sentences. Uh, using noun clauses in place of prepositional phrases or adjective clauses, writing a headline, which has a special grammar of its own, um, you know, the organizational structure. Um, so some different ways to do that, um, or you can give them writing frames um, that they can then fill in, um, which draws their attention um, to some key language. Um, you can also um, give them useful language. So you have to write, but you have to use these expressions or these phrases or these structures. Um, a great one that I love is giving them an ineffective model. Um, so you give them a research report, but information is missing, or the tone or the register is wrong. Um, it's um, maybe the order is incorrect, and um, having them look at it and fix it so that it, it's, it's a, a better example of writing. Um, that really draws their attention to why these features exist. Um, outlining, reverse outlining, I think is something that is pretty a lot of us do. And then um, just sort of direct um, uh, language skills practice or grammar or vocabulary practice. Um, let's practice writing headlines. Let's practice using the passive tense. Let's practice making noun clauses. Um, with the caveat that um, we are doing this to, for the goal of having them write a text. We are not doing this for the goal of um, teaching them grammar um, or teaching them proper vocabulary. So you want to make sure that the exercises are in context, that the purpose is limited to the purpose of uh, the genre. Because um, the passive is used for many cases, but we're using the passive. In this case, I think the passive is used um, you know, in this sort of scientific way to, just to, to, to put emphasis on um, the, the object or the, the, um, the object of study, not the people who are studying. So you want to make sure that when you're um, practicing, you're keeping them in that context. Um, and someone, again, someone mentioned um, working with other genres, um, a really fun activity to do. Um, 
and I'm gonna don't want I don't do want to leave time for questions and comments. Um, but um, a really fun thing to do is to give them the text with similar content, but in a different genre. And this is sort of an extreme example um, that I thought was fun. Um, so this is a personal letter written from the researcher to his friend. And um, students can work in groups and talk about what's different, um, what's changed, um, and therefore what do they need to do when they write in our target genre of brief report. Um, this is obviously an extreme example, um, but you'll notice a number of differences that the students have to work with. Um, the format of the letter is obviously has to go. Dear Bob, best to Sarah, love, Bolton. <clears throat> the personal comments, how are you? Um, you know, the reasons they're given here are not very scientific. Um, you know, um, you know how I feel about not getting enough sleep since I'm such a bad sleeper. That's why I'm doing this research. That's not a reason to do research that we can in a um, newspaper article, um, right? Presumably. Um, so if you go down, um, we did this one really interesting test where we had them steer remote control cars and then we played really loud sounds. Um, in a brief report in the newspaper, they don't talk about like, oh, this one test was really cool. It was really fun. It was awesome. Um, and it was really funny when this guy like messed up. Um, but that's something that we talk about in personal ways. Um, so this is sort of a fun, exciting thing students can do. Um, translate from one genre to another. Um, and then finally, um, well not finally, I would say finally, um, but almost finally, penultimately, um, there's the actual writing, the individual writing, where they produce their target text implementing the features that you have been working on. Um, and this I think is the place where the sort of traditional um, way that most of us I think teach writing, the writing process, brainstorm, outline, the first draft, final draft, really fits into the genre approach. There's no reason why you can't replicate that process. Um, the only thing I would say is that the outlining phase um, is unique to, um, is particularly suitable to the five paragraph essay because it has such a strict format and form. Not every genre has that um, strict of a form. So you might have to modify your outline um, and do some other kind of organizational activity. Um, a mind map um, or a free write. Another um, thing that you can do, and again, you may be doing this in your classroom right now, um, is giving them sort of a more authentic experience. Um, so if a student is, the target genre is a paraphrase essay, um, which we often find in final exams, right? Um, summarize all the ideas in the class. Um, what did Einstein say about this theory? Um, you know, regurgitate, so I make sure that you learn something. Um, so you might give them sample lecture notes that they then have to turn into um, a paraphrased essay. Um, if they're writing a research report, you could give them the table of data that they then have to turn into the research report. Um, you can give them interview notes because you want them to write an interview. Um, so you can give them authentic experience. Um, and then obviously um, anything that they do collaboratively, they can also do individually and vice versa. You could have any of these activities work as a collaborative activity. So um, I'll wrap up in a minute. Um, and this is just an example that I took straight off the IELTS to show that the genre approach can fit into a very traditional form. So we have a table of data. Um, we have a little information about the procedure. And um, please write a brief report for the Guardian newspaper um, on this text, um, on, on this uh, information. Nothing, I think, too radical or unfamiliar. So the final step that I think is a very important one um, that we don't always um, think about is really having students um, see the connections between genres um, in um, a deeper way. Um, so, and it's a great way to then line up your next uh, writing assignment, the next genre you're gonna have them write in. So um, we just looked at a brief report in a newspaper. We could have them look at a brief report for a peer reviewed journal article, which has some similarities, but also some differences. Or perhaps um, a genre from the same context. We just looked at something that's published in a newspaper. Um, let's look at another genre that's published in a newspaper, like a features article or a news article. 
Um, or maybe a genre that shares a feature of an abstract is similarly a um, summary of research, can be, um, but it obviously has some differences. A science article is also similarly about um, research, but obviously it has some differences. It's often quite a bit longer. And then finally, in real life, I think you'll find that we have these sort of logical processions of genres in our life. Um, so we can teach students to move down the chain of genres. Um, so, uh, for example, as a teacher, um, we read a syllabus, which is a particular genre. We then write a lesson plan, which is a, has a particular genre form. Um, and then um, we write a test. And then we comment on the test. Um, so we could teach um, students in that sort of logical, authentic order. So I hope that that's been uh, some uh, useful activities and ideas. Um, and I do encourage you to sort of look more into the genre approach. And um, please feel free to email me, contact me through my blog or through Twitter um, if you have any questions, comments. Um, or if you'd like, again, I had a handout with all of these activities and points um, that I'm happy to share. Um, and I'd love to just open it up um, to any questions, comments, suggestions, since some of you are familiar with the genre approach. Um, and thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, thank you, Walton. That was very interesting. Um, very, very interesting. Something I'll have to try with my students this year. Does anybody have any questions for Walton before we wrap up this first uh, concurrent session? By the way, Walton, I would be remiss if I didn't say that you're always welcome to come and present at our Belt Day here in Belgium if you ever wanted to uh, oh, just check froze. out the country. And uh, see the city of Brussels, which uh, is where our conference is held. Mm -hmm. No question? Apparently, I've explained everything perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought you did. I thought it was very clear to me. So, um, Walton, I would like to thank you very much for uh, taking time out of your Saturday morning. Uh, to share this uh, this genre analysis approach with us, uh, it was very very interesting, and we're very uh, we're very glad that you uh, that you presented today. No, thank you.